The Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague, the man whose capital allocation framework always comes up with the right decision. It's Anthony McDonald. Anthony, how are you? I think my framework says more maintenance capex, please, post-reporting season, James. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, this week we dig into the big issues raised by the government's intergenerational report. We examine Qantas's monster profit and look ahead to the next week's key update on inflation. But first, Anthony, earnings season is all but done, mate, with a couple of stragglers to come next week. So we thought it was time to break out the champagne and announce a few awards from the uh, earnings period that's been. But we have thought a bit laterally here with the names of our awards. See if you can pick up the theme. Anthony, start us off. That's right, James. So first up, we've got the Walking on Eggshells Award for the most fragile company. And I'm nominating Iris. It's a financial software company. Fund managers use it for trading systems and uh, monitoring markets, and this thing's cooked near term. Its uh, <laughs> revenue growth has slowed, costs are up, it's had four downgrades in 12 months, it's carrying debt worth about three times earnings. I mean, it's got a new CEO, Marcus Price, who, ter- who signed up for a turnaround job. It's probably a bigger turnaround job than he realized, mm. and um, this thing could be in a bit of trouble. The shares are down 40% in the past week. 40%? Wow. Okay. Well- I'm, uh, I've opened the envelope here for the Chicken Skin Award for the sneakily tasty profit result. And the winner is Woolworths. Uh, a big jump in profit, about 13.5%, did raise a few eyebrows. Uh, but in comparison, I think it shows that Coles is, uh, in comparison to Coles, it shows that Woolworths is doing a few things differently under CEO Brad Banducci. Now, he's grown Woolworths' advertising business. He's invested in supply chain. And he's grown Woolworths' broader ecosystem, which includes a business-to-business food services division. So that's all adding up to helping uh, Woolworths swim a little bit faster than its big rival, uh, even in the face of pressures on uh, cost of living and uh, inflation. For sure. Uh, Next up, we've got the Wings Clipped Award for the company that's had to change its behaviour. And uh, that's Perpetual, whose board hired a CEO five years ago to use its lazy balance sheet to grow. And uh, take this 130-year-old fund manager global. Now, the CEO, Rob Adams, has done a spectacular job of buying things and spending money. Uh, but now it has too much debt. Its biggest acquisition, which is Pendle, is in firing. Adams is copping heat. I mean, I have some sympathy for him because he's done exactly mm. what the board asked him to do. And yeah. uh, he desperately needs these acquisitions to start working. Otherwise, uh, he's, uh, he's in trouble. And uh, he's had, so he's had to change the strategy, hence the uh, wings clipped. All right, well, uh, the next award is the Headless Chook Award for the company that's battling for direction, and that goes to poor old AMP, the fallen financial services giant. Now, the CEO, Alexis George, hugely respected in the financial services sector. You will not find anyone to say a bad word about Alexis, but gosh, she's got some challenges. If you look at what's left in AMP, we've got a small-scale bank that's going to be hard to grow, particularly over the next few years. You've got a wealth platforms business. It's okay, but it's a very competitive area of the market and margins are going to be under continuous pressure. And then you've got this advice business. And the weird thing in advice is we've got a shrinking pool of advisors, lots of people getting older and richer. And so you should think, well, that's a pretty good environment for advice. But AMP, this this division is still unprofitable and hoping, hopefully it breaks even across the course of this calendar year. So I think Alexis got a real challenge to sort of sort through the ghosts of uh, AMP's past and then find the uh, the strategy to keep going forward with. Yeah, it's a story of decades of tailwinds and missed opportunities. Uh, that one. Uh, last of all, we've got the Ruler of the Roost Award for the best result among the many we've looked at. I think I have to go with Cochlear. We spoke about it last week, but this is a yep. big blue chip company. It's got its blue chip status back. Big growth in FY23, flagging more for FY24. I mean, I also like Borrell, CBA. I mean, Qantas had a big number. We'll talk about that later. Um, you did West Farmers on Friday morning. James, was it good or bad? Oh, it was, a, it, it was very impressive, actually. Yeah. Uh, Bunnings is their big business. Now, that's come off, but it's, it's, and it's, it's 
growth was sort of 2% of the profit line. But you've got to put it in the context. They grew this thing 40% over the COVID years. Massive. So the fact they haven't gone backwards, they're, they're taking solace from that. The big winner, though, Kmart. We are all shopping at Kmart like crazy people. Sales were up 22% in the Kmart chain specifically wow. in 2023. That's moderated since then, uh, particularly coming into the start of this year. But this is a very good result. The other thing about West Farmers, in the back half of this financial year, they're going to start earning money from lithium. So that's a bit of a moment. Lithium's a bit of a wild west. Now it's going mainstream with a blue chip company like West Farmers. So lots of people who maybe were scared of jumping in the pool of lithium wannabes, they're now going to be exposed to that sector through a, a big giant like West Farmers. Absolutely. Well, Anthony, let's move on to our first topic. And this week, the government released its intergenerational report, which reveals the challenges the economy faces from a rapidly aging economy. And it's not great reading. There's going to be lower growth over the next 40 years. There's going to be a rapidly eroding tax base as workers retire. And there'll be a warmer climate as well, of course, and budget deficits really as far as the eye can see. Now, this was interesting timing, Anthony, because the AFR had a little summit of its own on, uh, on Wednesday that went to look at the challenges and opportunities facing super funds in this environment. Treasurer Jim Chalmers was there. Now, what did he have to say about some of the big pressures that are coming his way and the way of the economy? Well, he said he's got five big pressures. So the five big pressures on the budget are the NDIS, aged yep. care, healthcare yep. and hospitals, defence yep. spending, and the rising yep. cost of debt, um, you know, just given that the, uh, we've got quite a big pile of debt and the interest rates are going up. So yes. they're, they're, they're the five things that are on his mind. I mean, fortunately for him, despite the fact we've got an ageing population, pensions is a portion of GDP and government spending are not going to change materially. So he doesn't have to worry so much about the, uh, the pensions, which is an astonishing place to be, really, given, given what's going on. And it, it makes Australia really uniquely positioned. Thank goodness for our super sector, hey? Exactly. It's all about the super system. You know, set up 40 years ago, created this $3.5 trillion pool of retirement savings. I think he said by 24, most retirees will have had super for their working life or their working life. By 2060, it should be, you know, 12% of wages going into your super for your entire working life. So there's this big, big stockpile that mm. uh, fortunately for the government is, uh, is protecting the budget. Yeah. And Anthony, that fits really nicely with what the AFR's little summit was about. It, it, it's an annual thing. We, we collect 20 of the 30 top dogs from the financial services sector talking about how Australian companies are funded. Now, Historically, most companies got their debt from banks or offshore bond markets, and we don't have much of a bond market in Australia, and it's still mostly that way. But billionaire Anthony Pratt, who has the Vizzy empire, and former Prime Minister Paul Keating have been trying to change this and open up a third bucket where you would see Australia's $3.5 trillion superannuation system start to lend to companies. We've held this roundtable uh, since 2017. It's a high-powered uh, group of people in a room talking about very high-level issues. But, Anthony, how has the debate changed in the last 12 months and how does it link back to this intergenerational issue? Yeah, well, Jim Chalmers actually explained this to me uh, quite nicely afterwards. And he sort of pointed out that the, the debate was always Australian companies need more funding options, you know, as Anthony Pratt's uh, Visi Industries went to the super funds for some long-term debt, which he found very useful and he's been trying to open up this market for others. I mean, that, that was kind of the, um, the dawn of this thing, this sort of uh, roundtable seven years ago. So, yeah. you know, he, Chalmers sort of explained that as a supply side solution, you know, get the supply of loans in front of the super funds and build it that way. But, you know, I mean, seven years on, it hasn't really happened. And so the, the debate's now switched to a demand side solution. So the demand side is the super funds who have this huge member base that will need retirement income more and more in the next in coming years. So the demand side solution is basically saying to the super funds you should invest less less in equities, which are you know high growth and volatile, and more in debt, which pays a yield, you know say five percent or so a year. It's a bit safer, and you use that five percent to pay out the retirement income. I mean, it's it's so it's a neat sort of solution to do it though. Everyone would have to give a little. Everyone that's in the current system making money in their current ways would have to think about changing 
how they do business. So, I mean, the banks would have to let the super funds into that sort of lending sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, The regulator would have to maybe rethink capital requirements and the amount of equity that's held against loans. So all these people were in the room, I guess, like NAB, ANZ was there, Australian Super, CBUS, IFM Investors. So it was really quite inter- interesting discussion. And then you've got, you know, Anthony Pratt, Paul Keating, Wayne Swan, Jim Chalmers. Yeah, big issues, but there's just a disconnect, I guess, between all the different people. Yeah, well, and I guess in a way, the most powerful people in that room are the super fund uh, executives. How are they thinking of this? And and how would this impact their returns? I mean, I I, I guess uh, lending to businesses by super funds would be good for the country in a way, but that's not what the super funds have got to worry about, right? They're going to worry about their members. Yeah, that's right, James. I mean, Don Russell, who is the chairman of Australian Super, he explained mm-hmm. it really well. I mean, he said the key tenant of this defined contribution system, which we have in Australia, which which we're not trying to change, right? We're we're happy with it is that members put their capital at risk, right? They're they're the ones that take the investment risk. So if you're going to make them take the investment risk, you've got to actually give them a good return. So I mean, that's, so the super funds have to be incredibly focused on return. So they need to be compensated. And he said his members, they want 10% a year because in the past 10 years, they've sort of got used to returns, you know, being around that long-term average of 10%. So I mean, the question is, can you get 10% by investing in companies' debt? And the answer is probably not if it's investment grade, right? Like we see bank bonds at about 6% yield, government bonds in the fours to maybe five. It's a big leap from there to, to 10%. So, yeah. I mean, something has to, has to give. I mean, either member expectations have to change and maybe the member expectations, are like the ones that are approaching the retirement age, they have to be happy with the, with the smaller returns. And so that's where the super funds will probably design new products. But- I mean, we see this time and time again, as soon as a big issue comes up, I mean, the solution that, that people put out there is always just get the super funds to fa- pay for it because yeah. they've got this big pool of capital. But like, yeah. we've spoken about this repeatedly, James, like, it's, it's not their job to solve the big problems in the economy. And it's not their money, Anthony. It's not, you know, there's no sort of thing called the super sector. What it is, is a pool of capital of working Australians and- the money belongs to them. It's not to be diverted to every crisis that the government can't handle. You know, we've yeah, and you're right. We've seen this housing affordability, or why can't the super funds do more venture capital? Why can't the super funds do more? Well, the super funds will do some of that if they can get a return, but that return's got to be their first port of call because it's not their money. It's the members' money, and the members are relying on it to have a good retirement. So it is interesting. Maybe it's one of the good side effects of having such a big and strong super sector that we do have these national debates. But I reckon the supers are playing this well. They are very focused on whose money this is, and it's not theirs. Yeah, I came around from the rain, round table agreeing with you because this this chairman of Australian Super and Australian Super is the biggest, the biggest super fund, the most yeah. powerful, the most members, growing like an absolute weed. I mean, the <laughs> the chairman was happy to you know in front of everyone. Paul Keating, you, you know, he's can be quite a tough person to disagree with. I mean, Don Russell, he had no problem saying that, you know, ret- returns is where it's at. I mean, the other part of the debate in all of this is annuities and these are products like private pensions. So they, they offer you a sort of like a fixed income stream and you're not so much uh, investing for the capital gain. You're sort of giving that away, but you, in return, you're just getting this fixed payment every month, quarter or whatever, and you sort of live off that. I mean, at the round table was this guy Apollo Global's Mark Rowan, who's um, out there in the market, one of the biggest annuity players in the US. And James, you interviewed him ahead of this. Yep. He flew out to Australia from New York for this roundtable. W- what did you make of him? What was his pitch? Where where could they kind of fit into the whole solution, if at all? Well, yeah. We, we, we did a three-headed interview, uh, Anthony, you, you, me, and John Shapiro, who's smarter than both of us and uh, <laughs> is, our, is our guru on all things credit. But I've got to say, this was one of the most interesting interviews I've done in a while. The way this guy sees the world, basically, Mark Rowan's view is that the world changed completely in 2008, and we haven't really noticed it. So because the banks were at the center of the financial crisis, all the capital rules have changed, and it's become harder for banks to lend very deliberately. It's become harder for them to lend. And so what's happened in has stepped 
a big group of private credit players who are now funding much more of business than they ever did. And Apollo Global is one of those private credit players. It likes private credit because it uses the private credit to as the as the bedrock for these annuities it sells. We have a big annuities player here called Challenger, and actually Apollo has a stake in that business. And we have seen this push from the super funds to to move towards retirement income products. So I think this is going to be a big part of the discussion. And you know what Rowan would say is that these two things fit together. You can going into private credit and lending to business does help provide the cornerstone investments for these uh, annuity products. So th- there is a match there. It might be a bit lower return than equities and shares and all the other fun stuff that super funds invest in, but it does match what what you're trying to do in in your retirement income. So I reckon uh, I, I reckon Apollo is going to be a bigger player down here and. Yeah, as I say, um, have a have a read on AFR.com of what Mark Rowan had to say because he's got a unique way of looking at the world and I reckon it's pretty hard to argue with, Anthony. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the other the other thing I came away from thinking about from the roundtable is, um, and Jim, I think uh, I think it was Jim Chalmers or someone around the round, roundtable uh, was sort of talking about this, and it's how much super should you have left over when you die? I mean, because yeah. that, whatever whatever you don't spend while you're alive, I mean, that's that's kind of savings, you know, and, and the government and perhaps economists would see that as a waste, right? I mean, but do we expect retirees to live frugally and die with, you know, 20 or 30% of their super sort of unspent or or should they be spending it? I mean, I, mean, I, I kind of think that people are happy to die with a bit of money left over to, to leave to someone and- and they also can't forecast when they're going to die and they don't want to run out of money. I don't know. What, what do you reckon? Well, I, I, I think of it through the lens of the intergenerational report, right? If we, if the super sector is all about savings and it doesn't become about spending, then our economy is in serious trouble because there's not going to be enough working Australians. So we need retirees to spend down their savings. We need them to keep consuming and going on holidays and buying stuff and being part of the economy. So we have to change this mindset. You know, we we want people to have a full retirement. We don't want them to be living frugally, you know, hoping that they're because they're fearing that their money's going to run out. We we need to we need to get over that. We need to have the right sets of products and the right mindset that says super is something you save until your retirement and then you spend it. Um, because otherwise we're going to have some serious economic issues. We need that consumption to continue from that part of the economy. Yeah, I mean, it, f- it feels like the super funds are all preparing these retirement uh, sort of products, which are going to switch to these uh, income income sort of products. I mean, there was one in the paper this morning, Australian Super again was was talking about an automatic switch of members over at the age of uh, 67 to like a drawdown or income stream approach. So yeah, I imagine we're going to hear more about this in the next few years as this wave of people gets closer to retirement. Absolutely. Well, James, let's move on to our second topic. And last week, you called it the biggest result of reporting season, and Qantas didn't disappoint. I think you were you were definitely right. It it handed down a staggering two and a half billion dollar record profit on Thursday, against a backdrop of a fair bit of consumer unhappiness. Now, size matters, James, but. You didn't think that was the real story here. It's not just about the profit. What What is it about? I think it's about how this airline has changed post-COVID. The $2.5 billion profit was about $900 million bigger than any other profit Qantas has produced. That, that's important. That number's important because since the pandemic, Qantas has stripped out about a billion dollars worth of structural costs. And so what Qantas is trying to do here is say, we have changed. It's trying to tell this, this is the message for investors. We have changed. We are now a lower, leaner, meaner business. And lots of people would agree with the meaner particularly. Yeah. But what that means, and, and, and because we've got this big profit, because we've taken these costs out, over the next decade, we're going to be able to afford lots of new planes, which we need as we refresh our fleet. Lots of investment in various stuff to make our service better, but we'll still be able to pay dividends and do buybacks and do capital returns. So Qantas is very deliberately saying we are a different type of airline. 
I think the problem on the other side is that customers have realised that too. Qantas is leaner and meaner. The service levels are different. Um, you know, the, the, Alan Joyce, the CEO, and Vanessa Hudson, the incoming CEO, both say that you know their their on time performance is good and their cancellation rates are, go, are, are decreasing. Their service is getting better and will continue to do so. But I think, I think customers will look at this profit and think, "Yep, Qantas has changed." My, my feeling as I've travelled was right. It is a different airline, and uh, the, the, you know. It's not the airline that you knew before the pandemic. Yeah, so it's absolutely, absolutely creams it in profit. I mean, Qantas is making much more money. Like out of every dollar it takes, what it's making, it's it it like 20 or 30% margins, right? So it's making big fat margins. But shouldn't that just open the door for a competitor, James? Oh, well, it should. I mean, I th- the, the domestic margin's around 20%, which is extraordinary. Before COVID, it was around 12%. It should open the door to a competitor, Anthony. That That's what you know, usually happens when you uh, have really high earnings. Someone goes, okay, well, there's plenty of fat there for me. I'll take a bit of it. But I can't see that happening in the Australian aviation sector. I mean, there's a graveyard full of third airlines that thought they could do this, you know, uh, Compass and Ansett. Um, You've even got the more recent example of Virgin, which it seems a long time ago, but it collapsed in the pandemic because it had been chasing this sort of profitless growth. It had been trying to take uh, Qantas on in its own game, and it's just really hard to do. So, yes, those sort of those fat margins would usually open the door to a competitor, but I just can't see see it happening here. But Anthony, I mean, one of the things that you've probably noticed this too, as you've travelled around corporate circles, the, the number of there's real angst about Qantas. There's real sort of disenchantment. How do you win that back, or or, or and does a big profit like this make that harder? Oh, for sure it's harder. But if we're worried about whether they actually can win it back, like of course they can. You know, this this company, like Australians love to love it. We want to travel. We like that they're Australian and it's ingrained in their culture. And and you just have to look at the loyalty program that they now have that people are members of. Like we were talking about loyalty programs last week and the power of them. So Qantas loyalty has 15.2 million members. It added a million members in the past 12 months. So, you know, customers, that loyalty program means that customers feel like they're kind of invested in Qantas, you know, like there's plenty of people sitting on big points balances that like the bulldust sort of things that this loyalty program offer. I mean, I'm constantly surprised at the people sitting in airport lounges. They get to the airport early just so they can sit around and eat some sloppy scrambled eggs and some bacon. (laughs) It's stuff that's worse than what you cook at home, but they like going to the airport and making the most of this silver status or gold status or the business lounge. Well, Chairman's Lounge, which I've never actually seen, but read a lot about this week, and it sounds like it's quite an exclusive club. <laughs> it makes little sense, but co- customers love that experience. They they love Qantas, um, yeah, and that's what's yeah. driving the outrage because people want it to do well, and they and they feel cheated, cheated when it's not. So that's a great point. Uh, uh, you're right. That we, we probably do in some ways hold Qantas to a higher standard because you're right. We want it to do well, and I think we've known how well it's done in the past. That's that's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, so you've got a real turning point potentially here for Qantas, right? Alan Joyce, he's had the keys for what feels like forever. You've got this new CEO, Vanessa Hudson. She's coming in. She's been the chief financial officer. Yep. James, I think you've spoken to her a few times. I mean, is she going to be any different? I, I don't think so. I, I, the, the message is one of um, continuity, uh, very definitely. That they are in lockstep on strategy, and I think the thing about Hudson, she's worked all over the business. She's run the cabin crews, she's run procurement, food and beverage, done lots of knows this airline inside out. But she has been really the architect of this COVID recovery. That's seen the you know the the massive losses turn into massive profits. So I think she's locked in on the strategy. It might be a different tone from Hudson. Um, Different voices always, you know, always changes uh, things a little bit. But I would expect the strategy is pretty set for a, for a fair while. What do you think Alan Joyce's legacy is, James? I mean, he's he's a divisive character, but my God, the the resilience and the sort of perseverance of the bloke, he, he, I, I think it's pretty impressive. Um, this, this airline and and Joyce recounted this story again on on Thursday at their results. The airline was 
12 weeks, 11 weeks from going bankrupt during COVID, from just running out of cash and not being able to pay its bills. Now, has the recovery almost come too fast and, you know, at the, at the cost of getting the balance wrong between staff and suppliers and, and customers? Maybe, but, you know, rescuing a business like that uh, from that position to get it back to this position, it's pretty impressive. As an as an investor, you can understand why why investors are impressed. Yeah, that's probably what I'll remember too, James, is the turbulence. You know, like yeah, like yeah. Qantas in, enjoys his rain and it's probably always been like this. It either creams it or it's about to go broke. You know, yeah, it is it is it is fighting with staff, fighting with unions, fighting with airports, scrapping for everything. And then at the same time it's got this hold on the government. It gets government assistance when required. It's um, it's quite a remarkable story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Anthony, we'll come back after the break. We've got a big moment on Friday night with the Federal Reserve Chairman speaking, and we'll look ahead to the next few profits of next week. Well, welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Friday, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. Anthony, uh, a sleepless night for um, traders in Australia because... uh, The Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell is speaking at the Jackson Hole Symposium tonight, just after midnight um, Australian time, and he's going to tell us whether we need to be worried about further rate rises or tightening or whether it's uh, where the soft landing is on. What do you think the tone will be? Well, I don't really know, but I'll be keen to see it because, you know, we've been so buried in results. You kind of forget that there's this, there's this yep. financial markets and global economy that's, that's going on. So we're, we're going to have to s- switch back to worrying about it, aren't we? I think so. And that's right. But Bond, while, while we've been worrying about Qantas and uh, companies, bond yields are just keeping ticking higher. The two-year yield is over um, 5%. And every time the two-year yield has peaked in the last 40 years, Something bad has followed because that generally means that there's a spike in borrowing costs and things start to crack. That um, negative credit event or that that bad news generally comes somewhere between seven and twelve months later. So it's looking like it's starting to peak again. So time to be alert but not alarmed. Anthony, a couple more profits next week. What are you looking forward to? Yeah, I mean Fortescue on Monday. I mean Fortescue is right in the thick of uh, the sort of China debate at the moment. We've seen the other. Big iron ore miners and other big uh, resources houses come out and say that they're sort of watching China, sort of feeling okay about it. But um, I mean, Fortescue should will have its own read, and I'll be keen to see what they say. Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, the traditional um, closer of every reporting season is Harvey Norman, which always reports on the last day. So that'll give us another view into how consumer spending is holding up. We'll get another little monthly inflation gauge on Wednesday. Do you reckon the RBA would have learned anything from profit season, Anthony? Well, I think the RBA, it knew that corporate Australia was making pretty healthy profits. Yep. Um, so I think that's definitely been confirmed. So I think, I don't know, I mean, the RBA is sort of on the front foot. I mean, what, they, what they've what they been telling us about when consumers stop spending and stuff, uh, that sort of start of May, we've seen that come through the results. So I'll, I think the RBA, will, their views that everything's going pretty well, pretty resilient. It's yep. probably probably uh, in line with what we've seen. Yeah, I, I reckon they'll look at it and say, "Well, the soft landing's not dead. It, it, it's certainly f- feeling okay." I mean, you know, the economy's cooling in the retail sector as they expected. Costs are coming through, which should sort of bring down profits and hopefully take more of the edge off inflation. But uh, the, the the message from the RBA you've got to remember is that they're not expecting inflation to be back in target till the end of 2025. So they will have expected this resilience, and I think nothing they've seen will have frightened them too much. So yeah, one one thing, James, I'll just say is um like I did notice a couple of companies start to talk about productivity improvements that yeah. uh, that the RBA will probably like. So I know Clean Away Waste Management, the big garbage collector, it said uh, it was struggling to find people to um to fill jobs, but it's been able to hire people much more easily and it's starting to get productivity improvements the past couple of months. 
So, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's probably something. Yeah, absolutely. And a bit of cost cutting will help with that further. So, yeah, good news for the RBA there. All right. So, we love getting questions here at the Chanticleer podcast. And Connor has sent us in a question today. If you've got a question you want to send in, you can email us at chanticleer at afr.com. You can send your question in in written form as Connor's done or in audio form. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from and email it through to us. So Connor asks, hi, Chanticleers. I am 21 years old and I'm in my second last year of uni and I'm interested in boosting my savings. In a high interest rate environment, wouldn't it be a lot easier for people to achieve this savings boost? So why exactly are people so fond of low interest rate environments? Thanks, Connor. Good question, isn't it, Anthony? It sure, uh, it sure is. Just depends what side of the fence you're on. It doesn't. Exactly. It? I mean, if you're a saver, yep, cheer the high interest rates. If uh, if you're a borrower, you want the low interest rates. But I think, I think to Connor's point, I mean, the reason why you hear more about the low interest rates is because it encourages, generally encourages investment and pushes the economy along. But for someone, for someone like Connor, Connor who's 21 and got it all in front of him, a period of higher interest rates, you know, I mean, it's it's going to be good for his savings. Yeah, I guess the other thing, Connor, is people like low interest rate environments because that says inflation's under control. And inflation, as we've said a few times, doesn't really help anyone. It erodes the value of everyone's money. Uh, So a low inflation environment is generally accompanied by a low interest rate environment. So that's why that's the, the sort of perfect storm. But one thing it's interesting on this, Anthony, talking to a few CEOs, uh, Darren Steinberg at Dexas and David Harrison at Charter Hall, two examples, they made the point that if you look back on the sweep of their careers over 30, 40 years, the interest rates, interest rates sitting at 5%, that's not abnormal. That's, that's normal. What we've seen over the last decade with interest rates getting very, very, very low and staying there, that's what's out of the ordinary. So maybe we all do need to, uh, as Connor sort of suggests there, adjust to a period of higher rates. Yeah, 100%. Like the cash rate at 4.1%, that is still low. I mean, I think I'm paying 5.9% of my mortgage. That's like historically, that's still low. So yeah, yeah Connor, yeah, you might have to just re- re- rethink uh, what a low and high economic or oh, interest rate environment is. And we're, we're still on the lower side of average. Yep, well said. Well, Anthony, uh, congratulations on surviving your uh, first profit reporting season in the Chanticleer chair. You've done a super job, so thank you. Thanks, James. It's been a blast. It's, it's so great to get um, to get all these numbers and access to people. Absolutely, and we've enjoyed really bringing some of that to you on the podcast. We look forward to talking to you next week. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, Consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson and Anthony McDonald, and it was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.